How's it going? Yeah? Awesome. All right, I'm very excited about tonight. Um, so just to take care of a couple of housekeeping items uh, before I get started, like I always mention, I just want to talk about our meetup group, so it's one of these slides. Uh, but we have grown about another 100 members, so we're somewhere around 730, 740 people right now. So big round of applause. Thank you very much for helping us grow. Our goal really is to become one of the largest tech meetup groups uh, in North America. So um, with, with your support, hopefully we can make that happen. Uh, and as always, uh, we do post any slides uh, and videos uh, of the talks on achievers.com slash tech. All the videos are there. And all the slides and other resources are located uh, on the meetup page. So feel free to, uh, to check that out. So when we started Achievers Tech, uh, our goal has always been to give back to the Toronto tech community and spark meaningful conversation. So I think tonight, uh, kind of diverging a little bit from our, our natural tech talk path, uh, we're going to do the, the spark meaningful conversation part really well tonight, I think. Uh, and we have uh, some of the, some great local uh, Toronto tech talent here with us tonight to kind of discuss the challenges of growing a development team or a development organization. So just before we get started, I'm going to talk about the, the format of the events. Um, what I'm going to do is I have some pre-canned questions here. I'm going to talk to the panelists for about 45 minutes. I'm going to try to time box them. If I cut you guys off, I'm sorry. Just trying to maintain uh, and respect the time of our, of our audience here tonight. And then we'll open it up to a general q and I'm sure all of you have some, some burning questions that, uh, that, you, that you want to ask. All right? So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get started. So can we get the, the mics turned on? Just to make sure we're ready. So just to start off, uh, starting from Peter and maybe working our way down, can we get a, an introduction? of who you are, what you do, where you work, and then maybe some sort of snapshot or story that articulates some of the growth that you've experienced within a dev team, just to kind of frame the discussion uh, going forward. Do you want true stories, or can we make them up as we go? True stories. OK. So uh, by the way, thank you, Zach, for no problem. putting this all together. Great job. I'm Pete Daly. I'm the Vice President of Software Engineering uh, here at Achiever. So welcome to our facility. I'm glad you could all make it. Uh, what am I? So just a note to our panelists, our mics, you have to hold them super close to your mouth. Yeah, otherwise the, the I hope so. <laughs> the sound doesn't come out of the mics. Go ahead, Jay. How's this? Great. Uh, my name is Jason Primo. I'm the director of development at OANDA Corporation. Uh, very quickly, just because many of you probably don't know what OANDA is, we are a player in the online retail foreign exchange market, which most people probably don't know what that is either. Uh, but think of it like. Uh, uh, online stock trading. Uh, so you would actually open an account with us, send us money, and if you wanted to uh, speculate on uh, buying and selling uh, currencies like Euro or Yen or whatnot, you could do that with us. Uh, I joined uh, as a software developer during the dot-com boom of 2000. We managed to survive the dot-com crash of 2001, uh, and we've been growing ever since. Um, I was responsible for the tr creating the user interface, uh, and time also created a number of other back-end risk management platforms as well as a few uh, connectivity to uh, some of the biggest banks in the world. Um, kind of a cool fact that I thought was kind of interesting is 
I've written about, the software that I've written has had about a trillion dollars go through it over the course of my, uh, my career. Um, in 2006, we took on uh, some venture capital, uh, $17 million from Index Ventures, and uh, some growth happened with that. Uh, my team continued to grow, uh, and from that, some new roles sort of a, a, a naturally uh, we were created and new teams formed from that. Uh, in 2008, we took on $100 million in venture capital funding and again, more growth. Uh, and I was tasked with growing the team from uh, 20 engineers at that point to 70 that we have now. Um, during that time, we've made just about every mistake you possibly can. Uh, so hopefully I can impart some of the wisdom uh, that, you, uh, that you learn when you make kind of mistakes like that. Awesome. Hi, I'm James Lockery from Wave. And uh, my story is somewhat similar to these guys, just it seems to be at a much higher scale over there. I don't know why I'm sitting up here and not in the seat <laughs> that you guys are in. But um, my, my story started back when uh, I dropped out of university for the third time because I just couldn't find a home for myself there. And I uh, joined an accounting firm uh, and basically started working in the basement. And I worked my way up to become the director of technology at that company. And it's a, uh, we had development teams in three different places and it was a, you know, a, a pretty big operation. Uh, that was fun for a little while and then I got really bored working at a 60-year-old company that didn't have a lot of aspirations to change the world. So uh, myself and my co-founder started Wave, which we began in 2009. Uh, started with our own seed money and uh, we've grown it to 600,000 users. We've uh, accessed capital, for, uh, the EC capital of about 20 million bucks. And uh, we now have a development team of about 50 people. And we're you know, just probably making all the mistakes that they've already made. And <laughs> I'm hoping to learn just as much as uh, as they uh, as they have learned through their their journeys. Awesome, Oleg. Hello. My name is Oleg Gusel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of 500 Pixels. We're a photo sharing photo distribution platform. Um, my background is software development. I've been coding since I was nine years old. Um, and I found it incredibly exciting. So so I just kept. Um, and about three years ago, we. Uh, started 500 pixels we launched the site uh, from my apartment and uh, from two we grew to maybe 30 people right now uh, mostly developers most, most of our uh, most of our people are tech in some capacity and we're probably we've probably made some of the mistakes that you guys made in the past. we probably haven't made all of them but um, there's some really interesting stories that we have with cool so I, I when we were putting together this panel we purposely you know picked people at, you know, in all ranges and kind of different stages of growth so we could, we could uh, add as much as we can to the discussion. So I'm pretty excited about that. And as I go through these questions, um, you know, not every one of you is, is absolutely required to answer every single question. We could pass it around and see. Um, so where I want to start off with is um, we hear a lot about corporate culture, right? And this is, it seems to be all the buzz in, in business is, is creating a great corporate culture. But within that, um, what is a great software development culture? Uh, within an organization, what do you want to strive for when building a team, and what is what does that great dev culture look like? And whoever wants to start off, maybe starting off with James. Sure. Uh, for for me, it it comes down to you know really finding people that are passionate about doing the thing that you want to do, and you, you know that that goes right through corporate culture. But when it comes to comes to developers, it, they can be a very unique bunch and. Finding the right people to fit into your your paradigm is is paramount to your success. So, you know, you could find the greatest developer in the world. It's just not the greatest developer for you, and it just has to do with you know if you want to move really fast and build minimum viable products and improve on them and continue to iterate. That takes a very special type of person rather than somebody that wants to build the most pristine thing before they ever launch it. So that's when it comes to that, it's it's just aligning it with really my philosophy of go fast, learn fast, and iterate faster. That's, that's the, been the key for our success. And just to add to that, one of the things that I've noticed is it's maintaining the culture. That if you start off and you've got, say, 12 or 15 people and they're working great together and they've established that culture, or the company has a great culture, maintaining that when you grow can be a real challenge and to leverage your you want. You really have to make sure that that core team that you have that represents the culture, that the actions that they have, that will really be stimulating the others. So you have to make sure they're positioned in the company and in the team to be the benchmark. So when you say, what's the, so what culture do you have, you can point to that individual as they're demonstrating the culture. 
just pointing at someone in the door. You have to go to the extent of laying those values down. You're making sure that you constantly reinforce them. And you recognize the demonstration of the positive things in the culture, and you deal in a constructive feedback method to the people that aren't supporting the culture. Because there's nothing worse than what I call hole drillers, where they pretend that they're rowing the boat in one direction. Behind the scenes, they're drilling a hole in the boat, which causes you just to take off water. So you've got to make sure that with hole drillers? I have. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell a story for us? <laughs> um, I think the, the challenge you get into on, you can have hole drillers on the team, yeah. which are relatively easy to spot. When you get into larger corporations, which is why I prefer smaller ones, you can get hole drillers in other groups. Right. Where when you're meeting with them and you think you've got an agreement on how you can tweak something, you've got the identifiable product laid out, and then behind the scenes, All the points that they've made already are really very, very accurate. Uh, it's all, it's the most important thing is the people uh, having an uh, atmosphere of transparency, making sure everybody's on board, knows where they're going is really important. Another thing that maybe wasn't touched on as much is when you're hiring technical staff, look for people who are interested in technology for the sake of technology, not just what you want to do, but they're interested in technology. They're looking forward all the time when it comes to technology because those are the ones who are going to help you make the right decisions, pick the right technologies. They're passionate about that. Uh, and they're going to inspire passion in other people. So always make sure that you can, um, you're can. you not just picking people who want to work nine to five. You've got to find the people who, who come to events like this and actually are, care about learning and taking things to the next level. Okay. Any other thoughts about kind of laying foundational building blocks of, of, of dev culture? Yeah, so some of the things uh, that we've learned and we've noticed, and we've uh, autonomy and mastery are, are very important, for, especially for developers. Um, it's, it's a big part of it is self-actualization and growing as a professional for developers. Uh, we also put a lot of emphasis on the quality of the work, especially the quality of the design. So we, when, we, when we think of ourselves, we, we think of the highest quality experience. That we can um, and you know, code is just a part of it, design, customer support, and our day-to-day -day interaction. So moving on, um, you know, as we as we build out teams, uh, in a very early stage, you start off with with a bunch of generalists. You know, in my experience here at Achievers, when we started off, we were four or five developers, and then eventually we started growing the team. Um, there becomes a burning desire to start specializing. You know, it's a, you have to do it, um, and you have to start introducing new roles, maybe tiered roles of developers, maybe specialists like DBAs, front end designers versus back end coders, and we need to start having that separation in the culture. What are your thoughts for actually creating those roles within the dev team? Is, is it really just kind of ad hoc as you go, or do you have benchmarks, or you know, what, what rules or tricks do you follow to kind of get those roles in place as your, as your teams are growing? I'll give it a shot. Um, one thing for us, it's often been quite ad hoc. Uh, one of the things you can look for, and what almost always happens, is someone, if you hire the right people who are passionate about technology, they're passionate about a lot of things, and they'll discover the holes in your own uh, own um, workforce, and they'll try and fill those holes. If they're really passionate about build systems, then they'll start working on a really improved build system, and you foster that uh, in them, and all of a sudden, well, there you go. You have a build team. You have a, a, a build engineer, and you're always trying to move people along towards things they're passionate about, because that's when they're going to do their best work. Uh, another thing you can do is, is as you watch them do that role, before you give them the title, you make sure that they're actually capable of doing it. So once once the, they've sort of established that they're actually the right person for the job, then you sort of stamp the uh, title on it. For us, it's been a very organic process, and it's something that um, uh, we just we sort of earn all these specialists over time. Um, maybe on the other side of starting roles is the idea of um, promotion into, into, into leadership roles. One of the worst things you can do is take somebody who's technically strong 
and promote them into management. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, you, you actually create two problems there. You First of all, you lose a great technical resource, and you promote a crappy manager who um, ends up uh, causing harm to the team. So before you promote somebody into management, you can have people who are great in technology and be great managers, but the first thing that's important from a, a people management perspective is to make sure that they can manage people, and often you follow the same rules of making sure you give them the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to take leadership roles without actually giving them the title. Uh, and once they have that kind of role, give them the opportunity to fail. Tell them it's okay, if this doesn't work out, you can go back to that other thing. Because sometimes people go into management because they think that's how they grow their career, and in fact it's not what they want to do, they just think it is. Uh, so give them the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to go back to a different role if they don't like it. So on that same note, um, you mentioned a really good point about you know you can't just always promote technical people to managers because they can make crappy managers. Um, what, but like you said, uh, it's always kind of goes hand in hand with, with growth. People have the perception that management is the next track in my career. How do you make sure you provide that, that horizontal growth as well as that vertical growth if somebody just wants to be a more badass developer? Uh, what are tricks to kind of, or techniques of kind of facilitating that within your dev team? Uh, you know, I have a lot of developers day to day just thinking that, you know, naturally they just want to be a team lead or, or a manager because that's, that's what their peers are doing. Um, so how do, you, how do you counter that philosophy? Um, for us, uh, we have uh, sort of technical leads. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're really having ownership of the technical portion of a particular product or server or software or something like that. Uh, and they become the go-to guru person. There's architecture rules. There are all sorts of uh, that don't involve leading people. Uh, it's a very specialized role. It's just writing, writing software is very difficult. Managing people is just as difficult, sometimes even harder. It's more of a black art. Uh, for, for us, we, uh, we actually strategically chose some of our investors for this particular reason, simply because when we took our first investment from Omers uh, in the city and tried to use them to, to expand our reach into the community, we realized how, uh, no offense to Toronto, we're, we're a Toronto company, it, it, it is somewhat limited here in the exposure that you can get from people that have experience. So we went to the U.S. to get our, our, uh, our A round round done and we did it so that we could access the right people when we needed to and it was primarily for our technical teams and so giving them access to people that have gone through great journeys through Twitter or Facebook or uh, Yammer or whoever it might be has been really really beneficial to us so we actually interface with a lot of these companies on a regular basis send people down to the valley to get them exposure to that just so that they can learn from what they've done validate the ideas that they've had complex things like internet scale, just learn from what people have already done. You know, learn from Facebook, learn, especially Twitter. I mean, they re-platform five times or seven times or something. So, you know, these guys really understand what they're doing and, and having that validation on it makes me sleep well at night, but it also it, it empowers these guys to think that I'm, they're not that different from Is, is a case like that, and, and you know, not only you're you're losing great developer and you're creating a crappy manager, you're also making the person unhappy uh, because they're they're trying to do their best, but they're just they're just not prepared for this work. Right. Um, so, but at the same time, what we tend to do is we tend to have directly responsible people for whatever the product uh, is developed, and they're usually coders, they're usually developers. Uh, there are a lot of designers. always a directly responsible individual for, for a particular project. And they, they may be a team of one, right. um, but they're still in a management role, which is on call for that. Right. Cool. So on the, in that same uh, vein, um, working with a lot of developers and kind of being a developer for a long time, uh, there's this perception that, that, that management is useless <laughs> in, a, in a development team. Um, everybody wants to be lean and agile and you know, constantly just working on the things and, and, and being the smartest person in the room at all times and not really needing overhead. Um, in your experience in, in growing teams, what what is the role of, of management um, in, in, in growing a dev team or in, 
within a development organization? So I think it's primarily the flow of information. Right. I think that's that's primarily the role of the manager, uh, at least in our in our world. Okay. Any other thoughts, Peter? Uh, I've been a manager for a long time, so I, I feel I have to defend it a little bit. <laughs> Managers that may not be doing a, a great job. Management is a profession. You do need to look at it from that perspective that you're going to reach a point where you have to make that decision. Right. Am I going to leave the technical stream or am I going to pursue a different profession? And once you are ready to make that decision, you're going to learn there's a, a few aspects to the game. Um, one is leadership. So if you're there to help people reach a goal, you're looking at the values of the company, you're looking at where they are and you're trying to match that. You're going to be a coach. Your job is to look at how you deal with individuals, whether they're brand new to the job and never done it before, and you have to be somewhat directive as well as encouraging. Or if you have an expert that knows way more than you will ever hope to know, and you can just turn them loose. You have to know the difference on how you deal with that. Because if you deal with an expert who should just be turned loose in a directive manner, it's not going to go well. And vice versa, if you take somebody who's never done it before, odds of them being successful are low. So you have to learn those skills as a manager. The other thing you have to learn is to do no harm. The higher up you get in an organization, the more likely you are to make casual comments that people take as commands, right. which you did not intend. And you find, well, they're off pursuing something that you like, thought we were just having a coffee and shooting shit for a while, and somebody's out trying to do that. And it was a wrong thing. Right. So you have to judge what you're saying and how you're saying it and make sure that Otherwise, you're not being a good leader or a good manager. And then lastly, you have to develop yourself. You can't sit and say, hey, when I became a manager back when the dot-com days were going and they went like this, you have to look at how do I adjust? What are the, the latest tools? What are the techniques? What's going to make me more effective? I have to get feedback. I have to go to those conferences that are not necessarily technical that are about how do you effectively manage. And you never stop that. <laughs> with you. I, I mean, I've done Pete's role in my previous life, and I did it at Wave as well, and I, about nine months ago, I hired uh, somebody in to, to do the VP of, uh, of technology at, at Wave, but he hates when I walk into the room, because I will go and try and destroy everything he's done just for the sake of continuing to remain nimble. So it's that balance okay. of you know, process versus agility, um, and you know, trying to maintain that. Uh, recently, for the last six weeks, I, I've come out of my office and taken over product management of, of one of our verticals, and completely destroyed every process that they've had, so that they have to build it from the ground up again. And we're moving so much faster than we ever did before. Uh, it, it's that constant reinvention of, of, of process because process can be very, very beneficial, but at the same time can slow you down dramatically. And as a startup, our biggest advantage is how fast we can go versus our competition. And once I start, started seeing that the, the process was slowing us down, I immediately decided to change it. So there's, uh, there's definitely yin and then yang to it, but the yeah. art is in finding out how to do it. I don't know the art, I just come and shit all over everything and they have to rebuild it. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult, difficult problem. Awesome. So, it's a great segue because my next question was about process. Um, and, you know, from that same note, like just in terms of, of staying lean and staying nimble, um, we often don't want to put ourselves in the situation of red tape. But, you know, as you grow a team to, you know, 30 to 50 is one thing, but, you know, past 50 to 100, 150, process starts becoming so much more important. Um, how do you sense, how do you set the benchmark for what good process is? Um, and how do you maintain good process and not create a culture of red tape um, within an organization as you're growing it. So your, your approach was, was awesome and extreme, but you know, in, as you continue to grow, does that, does that approach still work? Um, and, and what are your guys' thoughts on, on, on creating good process within a dev team? I think that the process, the, the way you have to do it is, as you, as you mentioned, you can't accept it. You have to be looking at it. If it's broken, then you need to fix it. 
ways. You also need to take a chance every once in a while to say, it's not even broken, but I think we can do better. But in doing that, you are building processes, whether they're written down and flowcharted, swim lanes, that's not a necessary a long shot, unless you're in a highly compact area where the outcomes are severe. So if you're building medical do away with the whole product side of things and just at hackathons. But Zach wisely advised me that that might just drain the team. Because doing those hackathons is a very intense event and very focused on all sides of it, building it, presenting it, having a great time. If you turn in that into we're going to do it every day, we're not sure how long it would last. Right. So you have to explore ideas, but not necessarily have to experience them before you right. say that might not be the best way. Constantly to questioning every Curiosity. Curiosity. Make it better. Any other thoughts on, on implementing great process? I had it, so I had uh, an audience member go through the effort of writing a note and passing it up to the front. <laughs> so um, usually I would say wait till the end, but you went through this much effort, so you want to go ahead and ask your question. Exactly. Uh, Questioners around the company Valve and how they've uh, proceeded with no management and, and arguing against managers. So, just to give some background, how big is that that company or that team? Do you know? Anybody know how big Valve is? Uh, I, I might be able to. 250. Yeah, I might be All able right. to jump in. I think All right. I might. Oh, I, I have read that the, the Valve handbook. Go ahead. Um, I think it's extremely cool. I, I think it's something that if you're starting a company from scratch, you've got a chance to do it. Uh, the idea of flat, flat hierarchy, no management. I think it's something that's really, really powerful. I think it's something really, really valuable. You've got to do it from the beginning, or I, I really don't think it's ever going to work. Um, you also have to hire a very specific type of person to be able to do that. You can't hire people out of school. You can't hire. Um, you you have to take fewer risks. You have to have extremely high, like even higher than high standards for who you're hiring, because every single person can go off in a separate direction and just work on something completely different. Uh, so you need to find people who are extremely self-sufficient uh, self and self-motivated because they're the only people who, are, who they're accountable to. Um, it can work really, really well, but you have to do it from the beginning. So w we basically do that every Friday where you don't have to work on anything that you don't want to. You just work on whatever you want. And it's basically a hack day. And um, it works very, very well at producing great prototypes for us, but it doesn't work well at producing production-ready products. So, you know, I think there's, 
Uh, I don't know the story of Valve. I just heard about it actually just half an hour before this started when, when Jay was talking to me about it. Uh, it sounds like an interesting idea. I just don't know, you know, being a founder and having a very strong vision about where we want the company to go, I don't know how not having management push a team to get to that spot will work, but you know, it's, you know, I'm a pretty unconventional guy, so it's something I would, I would mess around with maybe next time around. So wouldn't you say it's, um, it's also heavily dependent on, on your business, right? Uh, if you're building a product, a, a SaaS product for developers, right, that might be at one end of the spectrum, and building a, a medical product for production use is completely different, or a business like Achievers where it's heavily, heavily client focused, right? So how much does the kind of the business model play into all that? It probably has a pretty big, uh, big difference. Um, there's another company actually, Gore-Tex, also does this. Um, I don't quite know the, uh, sort of backing up a little bit, there's something called Dunbar's number, which is the sort of uh, social, maximum number of people you can sort of have in a social community where you sort of know everybody. It's around 150 to 200, and Valve is in that in that range that sort of fits within Dunbar's number. Once you get bigger than that, the whole flat management structure falls apart. Gore-Tex has actually taken that and they create little subsidiaries, all smaller than Dunbar's number, in order to be able to do the same flat corporate hierarchy, this, or non-hierarchy non the same way. It's really fascinating stuff. I recommend reading the Valve Handbook and reading about uh, Gore Incorporated. Cool. And one other thing is, is that Valve actually has a very rigorous structure of evaluating people that they bring in and they, uh, they, they, they part with. Uh, so I, I think that also helps them create that kind of flat structure. Mm -hmm. Without it, I, I don't think it will work. So. Moving on, uh, the the topic always comes up, uh, especially as you're growing as you're growing a team. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on geographically dispersed dev teams, and and then eventually, um, you know, maybe even outsourcing, uh, and maybe some experiences you've had in the past. I have had some experience with geographically dispersed teams, more so than outsourcing. So I'll talk about that side of it. Yep. So the example I'll give you is uh, two different. One company I worked for, I had people working in Edmonton, Toronto, and Galway, Ireland. And another one I had people in, oh, and that one we had some people in Australia as well. Then in another one, it was more typical, we had a team in Calgary, a team in Toronto, a team in Montreal, and a team in Ottawa. The challenges you get into is how do you get cohesiveness in those teams? Because they will probably start to develop their own culture based on the relationships they build, what works for them, bit challenging to get the best out of it. Right. Another thing you need to watch out for is if you have uh, an environment where you're, you're wanting to treat people fairly, you have to watch out for well, even down to the facilities level, where I had a small team in Calgary and bigger teams in Ottawa and Montreal, and we were cross-pollinating, so we would send people from one location to the other, which is a great way for them to understand what's going on and develop those trust and faith relationships. But always come back with, but they've got a pool table. Right. <laughs> they've got a foosball table. And so you have to be ready for, yeah, you're right, there should be some equality on making sure that people get the same perks and the same benefits based on a, a corporate culture rather than somebody feeling they're taking a left out. The other thing that I experienced was if you have a very small team somewhere, right. they tend to be faster. There, there is things to be said about Right. That's what looks valid in large teams is to try to break them up into smaller self-contained units. And that team was always done part of any project faster than anybody else and always looking for more work. So we had to find ways to challenge them so that they, well, what am I going to do now kind of syndrome. We also uh, ran into them not feeling that they were part of the team. Because we, they, we bought a company based in Calgary and it was only seven people in the company. We tripled the size, got it up to 20, but they wanted to maintain their unique culture. Right. And they were trying the reverse takeover thing on how can we get everybody else, which was not a bad idea. They right. had great ways of doing things, but it was a challenge to get them out of their world and leave Calgary and come to the, the East and participate in trying to, to foster that. Those are the kinds 
the challenges of conquering them is you have to spend a lot of time in there. Right. So if you're managing that environment, you have to go to those locations. You cannot stay home. Uh, you have to get there and see firsthand what's going on and participate. You have to move them around. You have to get them to come to the other locations to build that trust and faith on how we work together and be able to deal with conflict. And you have to make sure cheaper over there or the, that guy, guy's a great developer in this city. There's so much more after you make the hire that you have to take into account. Any other thoughts on geographically dispersed teams outsourcing? Um, sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, I can't add too much. Uh, Oanda has about 300 employees, about 200 to 250 are in the Toronto office and we're all on the same floor. So that already sort of starts to say what we think about outsourcing and geographic distribution. We want to have as many people as we can in the same place and as many as we can have even on the same floor. It's really important to have those hallway conversations with people that you might not necessarily talk to. It's a really powerful thing to keep a company uh, motivated and working closely together. However, there are a couple of opportunities. Um, if you have something that's not core, whether it's your CRM system or something like that, outsource it. Like, don't, don't work on that. If it's not your core product, don't work on it. Other people have already thought about these things and they're already doing it, and there's a, a, a much faster uh, time to market to be able to do those things. On the other side, never ever outsource your core competency, and there are opportunities to do that in a lot of different markets, yeah. and if you ever do that, you're dead. Cool. Yeah, I tend to agree. We, we have, so we have a very small team in, in France uh, that works with us, but uh, what we have to do is we have to bring been following us for a long time too uh, before they joined us so they're very self-sufficient they are also working on an isolated product right uh, which does help they their their own product managers and, and developers and designers uh, so that that also helps uh, but but in general we have really bad experience outsourcing anything and, and, and even people not working in our office so I think you know, usually we achieve way better quality if, if people are working Awesome. So, uh, a topic that's that's really dear to my heart um, is as you grow a team, uh, knowledge transfer and sharing of information. Um, you know, as you have a small team, you have a lot of knowledge wrapped up in, in a small amount of people's heads. And as you start to experience rapid growth, uh, the sharing of that knowledge becomes so critical in order for you to to move to move forward as a development culture. Um, what are your thoughts around you know or tricks and tips around? sharing knowledge, um, creating a culture of sharing knowledge, and, uh, and implementing that as part of the, the overall process of a team. So uh, again, I'm quite unconventional, and uh, I do some radical things at times. And we do some things that are baptism by fire. And you just pull somebody out that is, you know, if we, if we have a bus factor, if that guy gets hit by a bus, we're screwed. If we have a bus factor of one, uh, I'm going to pull him out of that seat, and I'm going to throw somebody in there and make him do that job. Cool. And it's just a matter of you know, increasing that bus factor to two. And luckily at that time, he's, he hasn't been hit by the bus and he can get some support. But really it's that, you know, I, I, was, a, I was a hacker developer when I came up. I, I self-taught, I coded on mainframes and uh, server, client server systems, I coded internet systems. And I really believe that any developer that uh, I want to work with can jump into any problem at any time and so solve any problem that I want. If they can't do that, they don't belong on my team. And so if I tap you on the shoulder and say, you need to go and do that job, uh, there's a really good reason behind it. Uh, so from time to time, we do that. Awesome. Any other thoughts there around things you can do to, to amplify or facilitate knowledge transfer within a team? Yeah, I think one of the things you can do is you know, be as open as possible uh, and just repeat things over and over. If there is a problem of you know, bus, fa bus factor one, uh, well, you, you already have a problem. 
presume that you do not have that person anymore. Right. So now you have to solve it. You know, the, the sooner, the sooner you address that, the, the, the better you will be. Any last thoughts on that? I think one of the things that we have to look at is the life cycle of the knowledge transfer. There's right. the stuff you have to do to make people effective right off the bat. And some of the things that uh, we're doing at Achievers on is during the onboarding process, there's both the onboarding into how does the company work, as well as what are the key things you have to know within the dev team in order to be successful. So I think that's a, a great way to speed up the, the efficiency of getting over the learning. <coughs> Another thing is the buddy system. I don't have a lot of experience personally with pair programming, but that's a great example on how you can speed up the knowledge transfer in a short period of time by having people work closely together. But you can also achieve that by having a buddy system where formally somebody new comes in, might be junior, might be a co-op student, they might just be a recent grad, so you pair them up with someone more senior for that first while so they quickly assimilate the, the knowledge rather than trying to do it by education and training. Right. So I think that personal touch, and I love the idea of throw them in to really ramp up the learning curve where you can take advantage of that to, to help people learn new things. Cool. Uh, I think some of the stuff that we've learned uh, with Chris on the, the product support side, right. it's a great opportunity. People don't always say, oh, I'm going to work in support for a while. But it's a great learning opportunity. You're going to be exposed to all aspects of the platform you're working on very quickly and in a fairly high pressure environment to get it done, get it fixed quickly, and get it right. So but these are all great knowledge transfer opportunities. So, quality of, of code and quality of product. Um, generally, when you have a small team, people care more. It's just the, nat the natural kind of phenomenon of, of having a smaller team. There's more, more ownership. People care more about the result and the product and the code. Um, my experience, as, you, as a team grows, that, that sense of ownership and that sense of uh, quality uh, tends, to, tends to be diluted over time. How do you keep quality high um, throughout, throughout growing a team? Part of it is to keep your standards extremely high. It sounds really trivial to say you keep quality high by keeping your standards high, but it sort of, it's, it's sort of self-evident. Um, one thing that we had early on when we were a very small number of developers that kept quality high is that you were essentially, if you were the developer who wrote the code, you were on call. So if something went wrong, you got a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'll bet you that you were very, very motivated to make sure your software was better next time around. Mm -hmm. We kept that going as long as we possibly could. Uh, then we had an operations team because it, just, it doesn't scale after a certain amount of time. Uh, so then you have to cr increase, uh, create other sort of types of healthy tension. Uh, we have a re reliability and performance team whose job it is to basically try and break our software all the time from a performance point of view. So that's where we try and maintain the uh, same level Another thing is sometimes when you're small, especially when you're a startup, uh, your, your, your time to market is the most important thing for you. So you're, you're, you're cutting as many corners as you safely can, but as you get larger, you can, you can implement a little bit of process like code reviews, unit testing, all of that kind of stuff that will actually allow you to, um, to have higher quality. <laughs> uh, so for, for us, we, uh, we do it by just putting the ownership on the development team, and uh, I, that starts from the hiring process, which I think is one of your later questions, yep. so I won't get into that, but the, uh, the code review process is a mandatory step. We have test engineers that live with our delivery teams, so we have smaller delivery teams with the test engineer. Our developers release directly into production they're responsible for the quality of their code. So the standards are extremely high because you release something into production that's broken. We run financial systems. People's businesses depend on the viability of our products. So you really cannot make a mistake when you're releasing code that's uh, in a critical part of our application. So there's, uh, it, it really is a developer standard. It's not something that, that I tap people on the shoulders and say, hey, you know, quality is important. Well, they know it. And uh, I do hold it over them that I use the product myself. I use it every single day. And, uh, we use the product internally with with our teams, and it's just one of those things that we we just uh, we make sure that the accountability is owned by the, the person writing the code. Cool. Tolik. Yeah. 
I think uh, I, I think it's right that you need to, to, to set the bar really high. And you need to you need to you need to be true to yourself and to your organization to, to keep it like that all the time. And, you know, as part of it, uh, keep the quality of the code high. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've brought in uh, people who who tend to own the products uh, they develop. And actually look up to the person who, who, who was the creator, the original leader of the product. And you know, by setting that bar high, they, they try to, to, to get to that point as well. So they, it, would, it would almost be you know, unacceptable to themselves to release something inferior to, to the code of the product that's already been built. Cool. So I'm definitely seeing a more of a trend towards you know, not making it a process problem, but making it an ownership problem, um, and have people own the results in it. The byproduct of owning the results means they're going to take the necessary measures to make sure the quality is high. And I think that's kind of the trend in, in a lot of emerging successful de development companies uh, as, as that I'm seeing right now in the market. Yeah, sure. Just from a scaling perspective, right. I agree with everything everybody said about getting that culture, getting it right. It gets more difficult as you get bigger because just by size, you're going to produce more defects if right. you don't take this stuff to heart. And also, the larger the team size is, the more difficult it is to get communication to work effectively. And if you're not communicating effectively, because I totally agree with having a co-location, which is try to keep it in one place. But sometimes you're forced into it even just by, oh, I couldn't get everybody on one floor. And now you're into multiple floors, and the communication gets harder. As soon as that occurs, your quality is going to take a hit. Right. You have to be really vigilant as you grow. Don't believe that what you did at size A early part of the development process to make sure it's not all lumping and hitting it and testing it. As teams get bigger, ownership will get diluted naturally, right? Awesome. So I don't want to spend too much time on it because we're running out of time here, but um, really quickly, how, how do you justify how big you need to be? I find with, uh, with dev teams, it's often hard. You know, I've, you know, even in being experienced to uh, growing the Achievers team, you, know, you hear numbers ranging from, oh, we need five more people to we need 40 more people. And it seems to fluctuate daily. Um, what has been your experience with that kind of stuff? And, and how do you justify how many people you actually need? I'll start it from the yeah. way I've always experienced it is there's two basic views. There's the top-down view, where it starts at the CFO level, for example. I right. would say, this is the ratio that I'm willing to invest. I, for every dollar of revenue, I will spend this amount of money on r and so right. they start from that financial level. And then there's the other end where it's bottom up. So you've got this project to do. Here's what it has to be at a rough size. Do the t-shirt sizings and then make your case saying, in order to do this, I need this size of team. And mm -hmm. all sorts of variations in between. How about from the other side, Oleg? Um, so, so there are two, uh, two ways you can do it. You can, you can, it depends on how aggressive you want to be. Right. Uh, so the, the more aggressive you're willing to be, the shorter the lifetime of your team will be. People will just burn out and fall off. Um, so I would say, you know, if you have an, and I tend to have a very aggressive position of what, what it would take to do that. Um, so when you say aggressive, you mean less people accomplishing more? Less, yes, less yeah. people accomplishing more in a shorter amount of time. Um, so you know, you'd be take that, multiply by three, <laughs> you arrive at the same number of people that you actually need for the project to be delivered on time. Any last thoughts on that? No? Okay. All right. So last question before we kind of open it up to the audience. Um, hiring great people. Uh, we all know it's critical. Uh, we all know it's the key to success, and people are everything. Um, what has been your experience with, with being successful at hiring great people? Everything from, you know, feel free to talk about whatever you think is relevant. Uh, we have a few minutes here. Uh, everything from creating an employer brand to interview tactics to, you know, culture within an organization. How do you make sure you have great people within your development team and bring those people on board? So I have a, a, a very, very minimalistic view of how you approach hiring a developer. And the 
there's three things that I focus on and nothing more, and that's what I focus our entire inter interviewing and hiring process around. Can they do the job? Do they want to do the job? Can I stand sitting beside that guy for the next three years? <laughs> that's it. It's, and that process takes a long, long time to figure it out. So we go through a very, very deep technical interview process where there's logic, coding, all of that stuff that has to happen, and you do the job. Through that process, they're also answering the other two questions. And if they get through my team, and they say, I want to hire this guy, the last process, they have to go through me. And I'm answering the last two. Uh, and I want to make sure that the person that's coming in, I'm going to I'm going to be able to stand working with the person. Because, you know, I to be quite honest, I selfishly built my own company so I could work with people I wanted to work with. And, and secondly, does he want to really do the job? And that's a really difficult thing to, to find in interviews, but I, I think it's one of my core skills as a, uh, as, a, as a business owner is being able to dig deep into that person's soul and have them tell me what it is that they want to do with their life. Awesome. And that's, that's what works for us. Anybody else? I just want to clarify one thing. Our interview process is not scary at all. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've played ping pong with people doing interviews with them. It's, you know, it's, we're a really casual environment. It's just, it, it goes really deep. Any final thoughts on, uh, on hiring great people? All right. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, we have about another 10 minutes here for questions. So uh, ask the question. I'll repeat it so that it gets captured in our video. And, uh, and our panelists will do their best to answer. So Alfred in the corner, what do you got? So the question was from Alfred was, um, he's a developer, and when he thinks keeping quality high, he thinks test-driven development, and that's not something that that any of you guys mentioned, you know, at that kind of low level, uh, what are your what are your thoughts on that? We do it. Uh, it's a good idea. Uh, we've found from experience, it's good to do it from the beginning of a project. It's very diff difficult to introduce TDD into a legacy product, something that already exists. Um, and when I started, I certainly didn't know about TDD. I think it's a relatively new phenomenon, or at least it's only become popular now. So with new products. Right here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Well, maybe I'll add to it right. a little bit. Yeah, I, absolutely. It, it works really well when you're just starting and you know exactly what you're doing. If you're, a, if you're in a startup environment, you have no clue. Uh, <laughs> you're probably going through iterations of products and you're probably trashing 90% you know, of them. Um, and you end up with a legacy product that sort of monsters. There's no way you can do TDD because it will take 
for to write tests to cover the existing the existing code uh, base. So you basically don't do it. Uh, I've never seen a I've never seen a case where this was successfully done with the existing legacy product. Uh, it does work really well with if you know exactly what you're doing and you're starting. So the question was, um, do you think it's possible to grow a company to a large size uh, without having a corporate culture? A good company or bad? <laughs> single day. I think culture will happen regardless of whether you pay attention and you actually actively building it or not. And, you know, it's best for you that you build it and you create it. Uh, because if you don't, then you, you will end up with a culture you may not like. So it, it needs to be aligned with the development culture if you're a developing organization. Yeah, I think uh, just to add on my two cents, uh, you know, corporate culture, it's, it's very easy to bucket process and red tape into corporate culture, and it's a very good scapegoat for, I don't want corporate culture, I don't, I don't want that scapegoat. So I, you know, to the, in alignment with everything our panelists have said, I think it's really about just creating, you know, your value set and then questioning everything. And then whether something gets bucketed as corporate or not, whether, if it's the right thing to do, then whatever. Um, so just question everything, have your values, and don't try to use corporate as a scapegoat. That would be my advice. I got a question here. So Joe's question was, um, you know, oftentimes you have an employee that, that's not necessarily fitting with the, with the culture of the organization. Uh, how often do you have to, you know, actually let that person go versus see that as an opportunity to coach them into the, into actually gaining the skill set that's necessary uh, to, to, to get the job done? So you have two paths when you see a problem. How often do you have A versus B? I can't give you stats. But the thing to do is recognize how many tries are you going to make? Because <clears throat> you've worked with the person and you do your honest best in coaching them and they don't respond, then you need to question, is it you or is it them? So you might get some exposure say, maybe I'll try pairing that person with a different manager because I think they, they're worth saving because you have made a hell of an investment. So far, they've made a big investment in the company. You don't want to lose it. But don't keep going. You know, your gut instinct is... I think the, the answer to the question depends on the size of the company. If you're in the very, very early stages of a startup and you don't have a lot of capital and you need to be driving value every day, you don't have time to invest in people that are not aligned. So you have to make those decisions really, really quickly. And hopefully your hiring process weeds that out. But if it does get through, then um, you know, really anything beyond one chance is probably too much, in my opinion. You know, we're now up to you know, about 70 people, and that rule hasn't changed. So it's, if you're not fitting in, we can't afford to spend uh, the time, the money, the effort, uh, of di and distracting our, ourselves away from our, our mission to change what you're doing. In my last company, where it was lots of capital and uh, a very profitable business, coaching people into success was part of the process. But you know, we just don't have time for it. I'll come to your question in a second, but in the back. Yang, what do you got? Sure. 
So the question was, um, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, creating a, a unified value set and a unified culture within the team. Can you guys uh, speak to diversity within a team with respect to different values, different genders, different backgrounds, different ideas? Um, how do you how do you integrate diversity when it, when obviously it has a significant impact on, on a team? Yeah. Diversity is great. It, it really is. It, it, having that extra experience in places you haven't been before. Right. So if you look at the whole development profession, it's fairly young. If you can get some diversity where you've got people, you know, I used to be an architect, but now I'm into development. You're getting the benefit of a thousand-year-old profession and bringing those concepts in. You've got people who have done things in a different country or a different culture. They've learned things. They bring interest into it. So you can't over-diversify, from my point of view, from ethnicity or gender or things like that. Value's different. If you have such diversity that you can't get a common set, set of values and think about things from the same outcomes that that's good or if that's bad, just to simplify it, then you've got a problem. You have to deal with that diversity. But from my point of view, the more diversity you can build in, the more successful you're going to be. Awesome. Right there. So the question is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have you know, an employee that's engaged, that understands, bought into the core values, quality is everything to them, 3 a.m., they get a call to fix something, how do you, you know, steer them at that direction to still take ownership but not stop what they're currently doing? Is that, you know, how, do you, how do you maintain that balance of, hey, keep that ownership and fix all the issues that you produce, but also keep going on, on this existing track that, uh, that you're going on in terms of building new product? It can be distracting. Uh, that's part of the reason why it doesn't quite scale as you continue to grow, because you want people to continue to be writing new software. Uh, the 3 a.m. example, I mean, when we started, everybody had production access to the machine, so you just went, you solved the problem. Um, that doesn't scale because you have all sorts of mistakes that you can make with people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and causing more problems. Um, the next thing after that is we have an operations team now. So we have a system where you can easily roll back your software. Uh, so if something's wrong, they do an investigation, they realize they can't fix it themselves, they just roll it back to the previous version and go from there. Uh, and that allows us to have the time to breathe and actually figure out what the problem actually is and move forward with that. And you can take that into account as you're developing the new software and, and fix whatever bug it happens to be. Got time for two more questions. Um, you had your hand up for a while, so. question was, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, as a company starts growing, you eventually get to a point, and I think we did touch on this a little bit, but you eventually get to a point where you don't know everybody's name anymore, you don't know who everybody is, and you know, as a business owner or a leader within the organization, um, is this okay? Um, how much should you fight this, tolerate this? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? So we're still at 70, so we're under that, that rule, so I still know everybody's name. Um, for the most part, on the technical side or product side, I interview everybody that hired so that that helps but I think the key thing I have let people be hired without me interviewing them and it comes down to trust and it's there's key people in your organization that you know that you can lean on that reflect your vision your standards what the company that you're aligned with them and they're aligned with you on the company that you're building together and if they say I I'm solid with this person then I, that's good enough for me so that's that's really what it comes down to, is, is being able to trust people outside of your own little window that you've got to, on, on the company. And you have to get to that stage at some point. All right. So last question, let's make, let's make it a good one. Um, somebody's going to hate me here. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, we'll, get, we'll do two more. Okay, so here.
question. I, I think it's a great one. Um, is we often talk about you know promoting a really strong technical person to a management role uh, is often a bad decision because you get you know you lose one of your best technical resources and you create a crappy manager. But how about the flip side, when a great manager might be a, you know a bad developer or average developer, and you're actually promoting that developer into a management position? How do you you know steer clear of the, the resentment? Um, and because of the fact that developers often kind of measure themselves against each other, um, how do you how do you deal with those situations? Well, I guess I opened that door, so I better give an answer. Um, <laughs> It's tricky. Uh, software developers, I've learned over the years, are a finicky bunch who uh, are, 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 you know, get their feelings hurt pretty easily sometimes. Uh, so, I think the, the best way to do it is is to make that leadership opportunity a fair opportunity. And you, what we do is we actually uh, post our positions available. We have a team lead role, a manager role open in the company, and allow everybody to apply. Uh, so if the you know, superstar who might not be as good a manager applies. Uh, we give them the same interview as we give to the other person, uh, and we, we evaluate them on that. So they, they, it has occasionally occurred that the person we thought who might not be a good fit actually did turn out to be the right candidate. Often it's not, and you can tell them at the end, it's, it's up to us then for them to be able to grow to say, these are the things that we were looking for, these are the things that you might need to grow, uh, and this is why we chose that person. It's a very open and transparent so that's the other thing about software developers, that transparency is really, really key. You can't give a bogus answer to a software developer and expect them to answer it because they'll just see right through it and they'll hate you for it. So never never lie to your developers. Never try and save their feelings by, by telling them a lie. It's, it's a terrible idea. So I don't know how tired you guys are, so I'm going to take a bit of a vote. Um, hands up if you want to continue with a few more questions. Okay, so majority of it. So we'll, we'll do a few more questions. So who else has a question here? In the back back corner over there. Sure. So, so the question was on, on the structure of a team because we didn't really we didn't really touch on that. We talked about managers and some roles, but um, you know we had some examples of environments where you push to production hundred times a week. Uh, can we comment on what a good structure of a development team looks like? Uh, obviously, there has to be not very much friction in order to do that. We, we do have some intentional friction because uh, we are a financial institution. We're dealing with billions of dollars moving around every single day. Uh, so the, the consequences are high if we make a mistake. Uh, so I actually wasn't responsible for, for our build process. A guy named Mike Gentili is a fascinating guy to talk to. Uh, but the idea is we... Um, commit the code to the uh, Git repository. There's a uh, code review, two people look at it, uh, runs through a build process where some unit tests happen. It goes to a staging environment where uh, someone else will actually look at it uh, and, and actually integrate it with the rest of the software that goes on there to make sure that it just passes a smoke test. Uh, then the operations team will release it. So it's actually, it sounds like a lot of things, but it's actually a pretty smooth process once you, once you get into it. Uh, then the operations team releases it. Usually our releases, actually, most of them are on Fridays. The Forex market shuts down on Fridays. usually dump out a whole bunch of releases all at once, although we are able to release uh, midweek as well for some for some software. Um, and again, the, the rollback process is very, very valuable, so we can always roll back if it's a, if it's a problem. Uh, and we also have one extra piece of um, uh, kit in our, in our rule book that allows us a lot of extra flexibility is we have something called the FX Game Platform where we give our customers uh, accounts with fake money in them, and we allow them to do their own trading with fake money so they can test their own systems and, and try and make money or, or, or test out how they're trading. Um, and that's our beta testing platform. We don't tell them that. We say it's, it's a service for you to be able to test your trading strategies, but it's actually, we got thousands of people who are beta testing our software for us. Yeah. So we get to actually um, benefit from that, and then it goes into production. So it's rapid releases, small releases, and can we talk a little bit about, on the same note, uh, just maybe can some of you give some snapshot into, well, what, what does the structure actually look like in your teams? So VPs, managers, developers, team leads, like, you know, it's, it's, it is a very immature industry. Senior, junior, like, wh do you guys have rules of thumb as far as ratios go and, and what roles you actually need in place? So you guys uh, work with teams that are all drastically different sizes, so can you give some insight into, into what your teams look like in a very 50,000 foot view? talk about the team we have today? Sure. So at Achievers in uh, the 
binary experience team is what we <laughs> call the overall structure, which covers the software engineering, Dev and QA, plus our IT group that takes care of all the, the technical side and the operations. So I'll talk more about the Dev and QA side. So as far as the overall structure, is pretty simple. We've got the devs, we have uh, a couple of managers, and uh, four team leads. And the idea there is we want to make sure that we have enough coaching and leadership capability so that there's a healthy ratio, not overwhelming individual manager with, all right, you've got 15 people and you've got to make sure not only they're doing a good job, but what are their career aspirations, are you doing performance management, are they having one-on-ones, just too big a load to put on one person. So we started to diversify that and give people that are interested in pursuing some management capabilities the opportunity to act as a team lead and be formally recognized for that. And then we also have created an architecture and tools group because we want to make sure that the dev team is primarily focused on making sure that we're pumping out the sprints, getting the, the deliveries ready to go for our customers. But we know we have to get ahead of the curve. We have to make sure our architecture is ahead so that dev can build into it. So we want to make sure we have people focused on that and focused on some tools to make sure that, again, the devs are going to get the capabilities they need, the toolkit they need to be effective. Yeah. And we're trying to keep it as flat as we can without, again, overwhelming the management structure. Then the other thing that we're going to move into is to get much more of a release, similar to what you were talking about, is a release management and change management function. The change management is part of our search to become ISO certified, so we have to have a solid certifiable process for that. The release management is uh, to allow us to focus on bringing all the pieces together. Since we're getting bigger and bigger and we have more interfaces to external groups outside dev, we've got to make sure all the stakeholders know what's coming they're all ready to accept it, that it's not going to you know, land out there and nobody uses it. So we're going to get hold of that whole release concept and make sure we're doing it correctly from a dev point of view, but we're well coordinated with the rest of the company that are involved in those releases. So, so it's very flat, easy structure. Sorry to cut you off here. Um, so any last, any last thoughts on, on structure before we move on to our last question? So, so one last question and then you know our panelists will still be around. For discussion, you guys can bug them after after this. Uh, you have been had your hand up very aggressively for the last five minutes. So I'm gonna, uh, yeah, no worries. The question was, um, our, our audience member here had um, some experience in the past with having a great manager, so it was actually, you know, in that situation would, would, would be opposed to the flat structure. Uh, and I guess the question bled into um, managing millennials seems to be a hot topic in business these days. So um, strictly within the development function, I guess developers kind of being a generally young breed uh, in the business world, uh, what are the trends that you guys have seen in, in managing millennials versus maybe some, some of the older developers out there? Um, and, and how does that actually work in your companies? So, I think it's pure bullshit, personally. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was always the youngest guy at, at the boardroom table uh, coming up in my career, and I always got that, oh, you're the next generation, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm hearing it from my executives talking about the younger generation coming up. And, you know, I look at myself in the mirror and I can't believe I've got some gray hairs and <laughs> I still feel like I'm just like 22 years old and, and I think it really is a mindset of how you approach people in general. The, everybody wants to have, be respected. Everybody wants to be uh, empowered. Everybody wants to have some autonomy around what their tasks are and what their future is like. And it's no different if you're right out of high school or right out of university or if you're, you're seasoned in, in the employment world. The only difference that I would say is perspective that the people have. Some people have more experience working in a corporate environment and have had their expectations set in certain ways versus new people coming in. And if you're just looking at it from the fact that 
they just lack some experience, they're no, they're not really that different. That's, you know, change is always going to happen generationally, but people don't really change intrinsically to who they are. So I, I think it's pure bullshit. <laughs> Alec, uh, I think you're right for the most part. I think I think younger people. I think in general, you're talking about hiring younger people. Uh, so younger people, you know, in their twenties, are driven by different different things. Uh, you don't have a family. You the time in the world, um, they are they are more likely to, to want to work on things that are, they, they consider cool rather than things that pay them a lot of money. They don't really care. Well, I mean, they do, but but not to that extent. That if it's not cool, if you, if you don't have a sexy product, then you're probably not going to be as interested. Uh, I think that's the only difference. So so when when you're when you're managing them, I think you know their their triggers and, and the, the drivers of their behavior. Might slightly different, uh, but they still do desire the same thing, respect, autonomy, uh, an opportunity to learn, to grow. I think that's just universal to everybody. Any final thoughts on, on hiring millennials, younger generation? Awesome. So big round of applause for our panelists tonight. <laughs> that was fun. I uh, hope you guys aren't tired. So we'll be sticking around for a bit longer, serving drinks. I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, Achievers is hiring like crazy all across the board. And I'm sure that every other company here is also hiring like crazy. So if you guys are interested in job opportunities, feel free to talk to anybody in the Purple Lanyard if you're interested in, in working on Achievers. If you're interested in Oanda or in Wave or in 500px, feel free to talk to any of our panelists here tonight. We'll be sticking around for another half an hour to an hour or so. Um, the next Tech Talk will be posted hopefully by tomorrow. I already have it lined up. And uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us on any of our social networks if you want to you know, pu push out questions to our panelists. I'll be more than happy to make that happen. Um, or if you have ideas for future talks, or even if you know somebody that wants to give a talk uh, with an Achievers Tech. But thank you very much for coming out tonight, and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you.